Good evening, uh, everybody. Thanks for, for being here. It's my great pleasure as, as Vice Rector for uh, International Affairs Polytechnic of Turin to open this, uh, this meeting, this conference. I hope it will be interactive. This is a, a one of the series top experience, uh, which uh, is an initiative that has been developed by my colleague, uh, Professor Michele Bolino and Professor Francesca Verga, that I really thank because I think it's a very important uh, contribution of polytechnics to, uh, to students and to uh, understanding the, the real world that's out, uh, outside the, the, the academia. Uh, tonight, we will have uh, uh, Dr. Cristiano Venturini and uh, Professoressa Francesca Spigarelli uh, to moderate the session. Uh, Dr. Venturini is the CEO of a very, very important company, which is uh, Iguzzini. Uh, I guess uh, most of you know I, I did because personally I always had a, a great interest in the products they develop and commercialize. Dr. Venturini has been working, uh, well, first of all, as an academic background on the uh, business administration at Bocconi, uh, master at Melbourne Business School, uh, master of science at general management at Bocconi University, and uh, also other executive courses at SDA Bocconi, Melbourne Business School, a very, very relevant uh, academic background, and also has been visiting professor in international business and assistance in uh, microeconomics. Uh, as regards his uh, working experience, he's been engaged in La Perla at Beijing, Singapore, uh, KEMPG. And specifically uh, with Ai Guzzini, he uh, ramped up his career from operation finance team to group treasure management, uh, finance manager, CFO, chief financial officer, and now he is CEO. Uh, it's very important, from my view, to, uh, to forward the message that the university prepares students to, uh, to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, to have the right approach to the, uh, to the working experience that will very likely bring you to other pathway and, and routes uh, different from what you actually study at course uh, universities. Uh, Few words also to introduce uh, my colleague, Professor Francesca Spigarelli. She is full professor of applied economics at the University of Macerata. Uh, the academic background again is on economic and business administration at the University Polytechnic of Market, and uh, she holds a PhD in economics and financial mar market. Beyond that, she is also prorector for research policy and European research policy, something also at Polytechnic very active. Pro-Rector for TED Mission, Director of the China Center, and is also in the board of our uh, China Center in, uh, in China, the, the, the center that Polytechnic of Turin has in, uh, in Shanghai. And she is Secretary General of the Italian Society of Industrial Policy. So you understand this evening we deal with, uh, uh, with industrial activities abroad, expansion of uh, production markets uh, from uh, uh, our Italian companies abroad. So uh, the key research topic uh, of Professor Issa Spigarelli is in the, are industrial policies, industry level analysis, China's economy, and uh, overall internationalization of strategies for the Italian firms and for firms in general. So uh, I don't want to, uh, to waste uh, more time, so I leave my, the floor to uh, Professor Issa Spigarelli to introduce our speaker few words, and I hope you will enjoy the meeting, and there will be time for uh, some discussion also. Thank you so much. Thank you for this invitation and for being here today. It's a very uh, great pleasure for me to speak in front of this audience to the students. The idea of this uh, conversation about internationalization was launched a um, few months ago when I visited Polito for a meeting related to China. And so the idea was to bring here uh, to share with you uh, the experience of uh, a young uh, CEO of a very uh, successful Italian company to talk about the internationalization strategy of this company and the internationalization background of Cristiano Venturini. So my role here is very easy, very simple. I would like just to introduce this topic. Internationalization, uh, you all know, I think, what is about. It's 
very easy to describe, uh, is going abroad and to develop business and to develop partnership opportunities around the world. But in this moment, nowadays, after the COVID-19 pandemic, internationalization has been challenged, not only by the stop of all activities that we had several months ago, but also now we are starting to think about how can uh, firms uh, live without internationalization or can firm maybe reduce the level of internationalization. I just report here some graph. I am an economist, so I beg your pardon. I can live without graphs and numbers. Uh, you can see here the trends of investments that companies do around the world, so foreign direct investments, investments in terms of commercial activities, production activities abroad. And you see the, the line, the trends, you can just focus on the, gre on the gray line, where you see that at world level, foreign direct investment, that means internationalization of companies, has decreased rapidly during the COVID, minus 35%. So it's collapsing somehow. But this trend of a reducing globalization has begun several years ago, I would say. So starting from 2015, companies around the world starting to th rethink about globalization. Uh, maybe you have heard this word reshoring, taking back some business activities from abroad to the home country. But the COVID-19 is the event that has really made a change. It is considered a wild card that has changed uh, many strategies around the world. Uh, and companies are thinking how to replan globalization about network restructuring, supply chain management restructuring. These days, you have seen the, the increase, the sharp increase of the cost of raw materials, the sharp increase of the cost of freight. So logistics is becoming a real issue for company. So today, we have the opportunity to talk about how globalization is changing around the world, because it is happening. Companies are rethinking about the way that they have followed to go abroad, not only export, maybe location in some areas of the world that now are questioned, not only because of the COVID. But we have also the opportunity to listen an extraordinary uh, story of a, a young and talented uh, CEO of a company, and we go through his personal history and the history of the company, thinking about how globalization and how internationalization is changing but it's still, I think, very, very important and central for every kind of company in every kind of sector. So I don't want to um, lose time because he is the leader and the, the guest, the main guest today. So I give the floor to Cristiano and then if there is some time, I can uh, uh, make some conclusion if in case we have time. Otherwise, I give the floor to Cristiano for his presentation. Thank you. No. All right, good evening everyone. Uh, thanks professor, thanks uh, professor for the intro introduction. A few words about me, actually you, you read and you listened to most of the information. I'm uh, 30, uh, 38 years old, I was born in Ancona, then I left all my way to Milan, I studied at Bocconi University, my course was taught in English. And then from there, I traveled a little bit around the Erasmus program uh, during the first three years. And then I moved to Australia to finish up my, my master's in applied commerce. Then some, uh, some other courses in executive finance. And I started uh, with uh, some, um, a company uh, that was in Bologna before, somehow still, and La Perla Group. And then uh, I moved to KPMG. KPMG gave me a little bit of... Uh, quantitative attitude as a professional, and then I moved to Iguzzini. Uh, the, the story was born, uh, I mean, yes, started in uh, 2008, so it's, yes, it's more September 2008, 13 years. After five years, I became more or less, five, six years, I became uh, the uh, CFO of the, the company, and then after 11 years, I became the CEO of the company. Actually, I feel pretty lucky because being in the same company, I lived the experience of uh, working for different companies. The first one was a typical uh, family-owned business 
Italian family owned business uh, company. So Guzzini family, typical features of an Italian middle sized company. And then we moved uh, into a new era, the, the era of the a more managerial, managerialized company. Uh, we had a, a private fund entering the capital and the shareholding of the company. And so several processes and procedures changed. Um, we open up the capital and not only. And then the third phase uh, that appointed me as a CEO, now we are a listed company directly. Our shareholder is a listed company at NASDAQ, and so I'm, uh, I'm managing Iguzzini, which became in turn a uh, listed company. So from a professional point of view, while being in the same company, I lived really three different, uh, big different experiences, not only for the topic and the tasks I was asked to do to undertake and perform every day, CFO is slightly different from a CEO role, uh, but also from the uh, environment I had to perform my activities. So actually guys, if you have any questions or doubts or you don't, uh, you know, you don't und not understand, or I'm not clear enough about something, please just raise your hand and, uh, and ask me. Um, I will go throughout the history of the company, uh, but before that, I'd like to um, show you the institutional, the representative video that we put together some time ago, and gives a little bit of rhythm and taste of what Iguzzini is all about. Briefly, Iguzzini is a leader in Italy, and it's among the, the, the fifth, the f among five best companies in lighting, in architectural lighting sector. So what we design, project, design, produce, and sell were wild lighting features. Some examples, so we uh, design uh, the Ponte San Giorgio, San Giorgio Bridge with Renzo Piano uh, some time ago, so it was a, a pretty important uh, and um, uh, um, important uh, and also with some deep uh, meaning uh, in Italy as a project. But we lit up uh, Evolution Tower in Moscow, Louvre in Paris. Uh, so we, we follow up really several projects worldwide. And this is fundamental also for the international strategy of the company. Without this, in, this strategy, probably today I will tell you a different story than, um, compared to the one that I'm going to tell you in a second. Light is the sensitive, the live part of an object, of a building, and of their relationships. Light means technology, but it also means culture, environment, a sustainable lifestyle. Light means energy for materials and people. Iguzzini is an international community, working in the service of architecture and light culture. Better lighting means better living. If I can't break through. Specialists in different areas carry out research to innovate technology, apply the principles of sustainable design, reduce energy consumption, and promote personal well being, as well as taking care of the environment to enhance and make the most of every form of environmental and intelligent life. Iguzzini is a company based on knowledge. Continuous training in the subject of light means a better quality industry, designs and products. Also means collaboration with great architects and light designers. To me, light is architecture. There would be no architecture without light. If you had no light, you would have darkness. Light is individual. It's a singular experience in a collective world. 
addirittura il design risponde alla pura forza della necessità, però è altrettanto bello che rispondano invece ai desideri. Iguzzini makes lighting equipment and systems that have received some of the world's most prestigious design awards. It also supports architectural projects, using light to give form and perspective to living areas and space. City sides, neon lights, bright in the way that every young girl's dream. Golden streets, the heartbeat, light and shade, the stage on which we play. This is home to me And when I'm away too far To know that she needs me So many places I could be In my mind And every corner I could turn Still this is home to me Iguzzini is present all over the world with international subsidiaries and showrooms, places in which ideas and values come together where training and research into light take place. These subsidiaries in different countries play a specific role in supporting designers and customers. They are essential partners when it comes to developing and managing lighting design projects. Research, technology, the environment and people. In every place, in every culture, whatever the time, somewhere in the world, Igutsini continues to work towards the well-being of people and the planet. Alright, probably this video can give you an immediate idea of what Iguzzini is and what Iguzzini does. I'm saying what Iguzzini is because the company I work for um, is a community, it's a, it's a network, it represents knowledge and culture in the lighting sector. Before we were discussing that Iguzzini doesn't sell products. First of all, uh, recently we, we sell lighting systems because all our systems are um, made of also IoT systems, uh, so digitalization, connectivity for us are clearly a um, potential, very important driver for the future development. So we're not speaking anymore about products, we're speaking about systems. And above all, we're speaking about uh, culture of lighting worldwide. So I, I don't think, I pretty doubt that you have seen ever uh, an advertising of an Iguzzini product somewhere. Probably you heard about Iguzzini developing a cultural uh, topic, a cultural uh, discussion. Why is that? Because we're not interested in selling one product today. We're much more interested in developing a, a culture for this to come. This is fundamental. This is what uh, Iguzzini and Iguzzini family did since the very beginning. A history that was born in 1959. So I'm pretty good at telling you the ancient history because uh, I heard it uh, several times. Uh, we were born in 1959, but we, uh, we were a decorative company. So our products uh, were closer, much closer to uh, Floss, Artemide, just to, you know, to, to, to tell out, to say out some uh, couple of pre pretty important famous Italian brands. So we were working in the decorative sector 
Harvey was the name of the company back to that time. And it was a completely different world, a different channel. It was B2C, business to consumer. So completely, uh, completely another world compared to today and nowadays. Then the com what happened? 1978, so for example, this was a typical product by Guzzini. Already that time, uh, the Guzzini family, so uh, uh, Raimondo, Giannunzio, and Adolfo at the time, understood the, the, the power of the design. So almost uh, all of our products, especially from the time, were designed by incredible architects. And now there is this trend of iconic design, of heritage, and we will surf it uh, as well as the other companies. Why? Because we have products in our uh, files designed by Joe Ponti, by, by Massoni, and they are an incredible, an incredible, they have an incredible design, and today they are still um, very nice. It's not about just aesthetics design, but the, 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 how intelligent these products were 50 years ago, they are even more intelligent today, especially after a pandemic. We, we, we want to go back to a round shape, to something that, you know, is confident ourselves. So probably having something to, 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 to shape, to strip, uh, not uh, so comfortable, uh, is something that uh, is not really uh, appreciated by the market now. So we want to go back to design, we want to go back to shape, we want to go back to a comfort zone, and design is one of the fil rouge across the years that can you know, tell us this history. Then what happened? Because most of the companies are today what they plan to be, but what sometimes and exogenous uh, drivers uh, forced them to be. So in 1973, and seven, between 73 and 75, the oil crisis, so most of the products were made in plastic at that time, and so Adolf and the family decide, okay guys, let's turn strategically from the decorative side, or market, sector, sorry, to the uh, architectural one. Products made in a different way, products uh, sold in different sectors, different channels uh, with different uh, stakeholders and customers. And it was very successful. So we start looking at the German companies because they were the best at the time uh, in uh, producing this kind of products and in selling this kind of products. But, and so here you see that we changed considerably the strategy and we started to look at the, uh, at the foreign markets in a very, very uh, convinced way since 1984. 1984, it was the first company set, I think it was Germany, set abroad by the, the family and by the company. Actually, we were discussing before, uh, the Guzzini family have, uh, has inside them uh, very successful stories uh, as uh, entrepreneurs, but also some uh, sad stories. We had a company that didn't uh, go at all uh, to the international markets because the answer was, uh, and I lived at that time, oh no, we, we have so much to do in our market. There's no need for us to go selling in other markets. We cannot even keep up with the orders in Italy. Why sh we should go and, you know, invest abroad. Actually, today this company is not anymore with us. So it's a sad story, and it's a typical story that in the economics book they call it as managerial myopia. So we had endogenous problems given by a myopia of the management, but we had also exogenous problems because when Italy, the Italian market, the real estate market in 2009 collapsed after the subprime crisis. So from the financial crisis, when it became a, a real, an economic, a real economic uh, crisis, the company couldn't really afford to survive. That's, that's history. Whereas Iguzzini, still we are, we, we are pretty confident with the real estate, no? because if you think lights, we put lights in houses, uh, in buildings anyway, we lit up architectures, so of course, if the real estate collapse, probably we have our bad days as well. But uh, if we go back to that uh, crisis, uh, did the world didn't collapse at the same time everywhere. So 
probably the, the US was the most affected country in the beginning, whereas Europe still in 2009 could survive, and then the big wave and the US were starting while in Europe we, we still had our, um, our uh, bad days, but we balanced. So the, 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 the capacity of the company, apart from the manager, to be present, and I will show you how present we are. You saw from the video, we have almost 44 offices worldwide, 27 companies, three factories, four a medium-sized Italian company is a lot, believe me. It's a big complexity, but this allowed us in 2009 and in 2020 pandemic crisis to not just to survive, to restart with an even more efficient and with, a, even, with a, even more strategic thought than before. Because actually when you are in a global, not the case of Igusini, but in an international company, you have also the possibility to share your thoughts with your colleagues, so there are uh, cultural thoughts, so you, are, you, you, you de develop openness, you develop uh, different ways of at, at, uh, to, to look at problems, uh, different frames. So there is an enrichment every day from a colleague's perspective, so I'm t talking about soft skills, but also from hard perspectives. And then I will sh show you, uh, or I will uh, you know, uh, describe you some really pros that an international, internationalized company can achieve, uh, whereas another company cannot. Uh, just a few words, then we started this process of, uh, of internationalization. In 2018, we bought uh, our, another company, in, uh, a new company, a third company in the States, Systemalux, and so we, we like to call ourselves being a part of a group since that time, so we were two brands. But then the, the love history, the love uh, about this, this, this story ended when the Fagerholt Group bought ourselves a year after. So now we are a part of uh, the first lighting, uh, architectural lighting company in Europe, among the, uh, probably the, the first five in, uh, in, uh, in the world for, from a volume perspective. And so we are very happy to be part of a bigger family. This means that also the pandemic crisis created some problems to Iguzzini, to the group, of course, but being part of a huge, huge and very well financially structured group, international group, helped a lot to get out of this uh, bad period uh, very fast. Here is not the presence of Iguzzini companies worldwide. Here helps me to explain you the business model of Iguzzini. Why? In black, you see the major international specification center. In red, you see major international destination areas. What I mean? In our sector, it's very likely that someone in New York or in London specifies a project in Dubai, in Singapore. So I have the specification country, could be London, UK, for a mall, for a bridge, in Dubai, in Bahrain. So having, uh, knowing that uh, from London, Black Specification Center, probably some projects will go eventually to Middle East, it's fundamental for us to have people in London and in Middle East. Why? Because the people in London will help me to work with the architects, the designer, the lighting designer, to specify our products, to solve his problems, to give the best service pre-sales. The people in the Middle East will help then the distributor, the installator, and at the end, who pays the bill to give the best during and after sales service and to avoid any despecification activities from some competitors. So being here and there is the business model of Iguzzini. It's really costly. It's really, uh, we put lots of effort because to coordinate all these uh, activities worldwide and not to lose any potential business uh, takes a lot of effort, but we're ha very happy because otherwise the Evolution Tower that you saw in, uh, in the video, we couldn't do that project and we are very proud of that. Uh, lighting designer from Croatia, um, who pays the bill from Croatia and Armenia, 
uh, the project is in Russia. The, some architects belong, comes from, from Italy. So it was a huge project. And we're very happy to follow up all this project worldwide. Because Cristiano, sorry, can I stop you just for a sure. moment? So you, we are used to, to teach together in master programs, so he doesn't care if I interrupt him. He is used to. So you can have an idea of how complex can be the internationalization. When you read books, usually you are used to think about internationalization as exports or foreign direct investment. That means a subsidiary abroad export or having a subsidiary abroad. Now here you see a totally different and more complex world where you have customer, you have specification centers, you have a world of professionals that live everywhere. So dealing with internationalization is a very complex and challenging uh, process that requires uh, a huge managerial uh, background able to manage these kind of professionals and different locations, different cultures. So it's very, very complex, not what you just maybe read about export or FDI. Okay. Thank you. And uh, so the, the, then we also thought that we should serve our customers in the best way, which means being close to our customers, to our markets. From, from Italy would be not enough. So we are, now we have three hubs, uh, even productive hubs, uh, one in China, one in Italy, of course, one in China, and one uh, in Montreal. So in this way, logistically, we can serve our customers better, in a better way. So less time, uh, more eff effort, economical and financially wise, for sure. But we are there. We are there also to solve any kind of problems. Um, uh, to, in, to, to boost the efficiency of our company, we also open up to new processes, as I was saying before. For example, and now, since we are in Polytechnico, it's not my field, really, so I brought with me a video, not to say any incorrect things, but we open up to world-class manufacturing. World-class manufacturing is a typical, typical, is a, let's call it a philosophy, and then I stop myself here, uh, brought in by the management of Fiat, uh, and we open up uh, to these kind of processes. Actually, we reviewed the processes in our factory Recanati, partially in China and in Montreal, and it was a big experience. Imagine a company from Recanati, our uh, order, uh, average order is 38 pieces, so nothing to share with, to, to the automotive sector, but we said, okay, let's try to, have, to, to, to win this challenge. And I think, uh, now I'm telling you, I'm showing you what we did. I think we won it because we, you know, being international, being open, we said, okay, let's go on with a new challenge, with another challenge, and let's see if we win this as well. And give me one second. So Cristiano was mentioning before that they choose to be international uh, in reaction to an external shock that was uh, the oil crisis. Sorry. No, no, no. The first industrial revolution took place in 1784 no. with the use of steam-powered machines. The first industrial revolution took place in 1784 with the use of steam-powered machines to drive the mechanical frames. The second revolution came about in 1870 with the arrival of electricity. And the third industrial revolution happened in 1969 with the development of industrial programmable logic controllers. Today, the fourth revolution, also known as Industry 4.0, features intelligent interconnected machines in a computer system able to interact with people and in the environment in which they operate. The lighting industry has long been characterized by high variability in demand and by flexibility alongside the need to contain phenomena of obsolescence and overstocking. So it has developed an easy transition from production for the warehouse to just-in-time manufacturing. In order to be able to produce in real time and efficiently, all departments at Iguzzini are equipped with latest generation machines all interconnected to control both the parameters regarding the state of production and those concerning wear and tear and maintenance. The files arrive directly from the design stage to the networked numerical control machines. 
This ensures maximum precision and minimizes setup times. Planning and the order of priority are sent to the operator by the computer system linked up to the other departments. In this way, production managers carry out constant monitoring of the state of the orders, while data regarding wear and tear of tools and those regarding maintenance are analyzed by process engineers. The interconnection also extends to all the suppliers. To guarantee supply chain efficiency through accurate planning of all resources, a supply chain management system has been developed to integrate suppliers online. It all takes place in real time. Trends, stock levels and a lot of other data are immediately available to supply chain operators. This allows planning activities that are precise and constantly updated. To be able to produce a wide variety of items in small quantities in real time and efficiently, it is important to limit handling of the goods. The large automatic warehouse ensures that this is consistent and fast. Materials are warehoused according to their size in three different storage systems. Handling takes place thanks to an exchange of information that activates both rollers and automatic guided vehicles for sorting out and sending the material to the assembly departments. In the assembly areas, everything is aimed at guaranteeing maximum productivity. Workstations are designed on the basis of the golden zone concept. A frontal work area of around 60 degrees where the operator works comfortably with a correct posture. The work surface is also governed by the needs of the operator and everything is within arm's reach, offering maximum efficiency and convenience. The necessary parts and components for two hours production are supplied to the workstations from a special picking area. Information on the quantity to be supplied and the time remaining for the work order are available to the department's logistics operators by means of a real-time production monitoring system. Online inspection is carried out on all the assembled pieces to ensure that the products function correctly. This phase too is interconnected by the whole production process and results in data made available to the system which can be used by managers in charge of quality and design for subsequent analyses. As they exit the assembly phase, the availability of products is updated and the information is made available in real time to all Iguzzini facilities around the world. The weight and volume of the pieces produced are measured automatically during the packaging phase. This data, which is needed by logistics for the shipping phases, is also available to optimize transport and service to customers. To sum up, at the center of Industry 4.0 lies an organized system of production based on communication technology of the items and work processes. At Iguzzini, this means cutting-edge technologies linked to each other with the ability to increase cooperation between the resources used in the various operational processes, both internally and throughout the whole value chain. So, actually, this, is, uh, also the, this describes also the, the, the investment of the company worldwide because then all the three factories are interconnected and it's not just a 4.0 program. It means that we are really leveraging uh, each uh, experience that we're doing in Montreal, in uh, China, or in Recanati, all together in order to boost efficiency and efficacy. Here are some numbers. Uh, you could see it's almost 1,500 people. This is 2019 data, almost 240 million euros turnover. Uh, 41 offices worldwide and three productive production centers. Um, around 27 companies, so offices, one company may have uh, just more offices, but 27 more or less, the companies worldwide, in order to uh, cover the, the, the business model I was describing before. This is, uh, the, the, these are all the brands belonging to the Fagerwald group, so our new shareholder, and then they just divided uh, these uh, 12 uh, brands uh, across four business areas. We are in collection, why? Because you could see is, the, is uh, producing high-end products, so we are in the top part of the market, and so they call it a collection, they put us with the three br colleague brands. I would go fast. So when we go, when we go abroad, we still go abroad, we ask two questions, many questions. So why we're going abroad and how? So first question is, there is a rational 
because we need to decide to go abroad, yes or no? If the answer is yes, then the second question is how we want to do that. And of course, where we steam uh, this idea out from, where we are from, is, is really influential on the way also we might, uh, you know, we might want to, to invest abroad. Here, I will go a little bit fast. Why going abroad? First of all, economies of scale. If uh, I get uh, more market share, probably I get more customers, and so I can exploit uh, more volumes, which in terms uh, reduce my uh, fixed cost, economies of scale. Or potential savings, of course. China is a typical example, especially until some years ago, where some costs were uh, slightly below, no, were considerably below than some European cost, labor cost and other cost. Sales sharing, I can go abroad also to uh, increase my market share and so uh, achieve a better efficacy in my, sh my in shares of sales. Duplication of local su success. If I'm uh, uh, successful with my model in London, it's likely that I will be successful in Paris. It's not like that, but it could be a reason why. Market penetration, of course, this is actually like the one before. Companies culture improvement. I go back to this point. Having colleagues from worldwide really open up my mind daily. Today I was speaking with my colleague who's managing the Middle East area. He's British, not English, British. I learned lots of times the difference now. So he's British and we really had a discussion from a different angle that I was looking at right before talking to him. So it's really a minor, a small and silly example of how important it is to have different cultures around the same table. Global sourcing and brand awareness. Uh, everyone, I think, heard about the uh, scarcity of resources, materials. So probably, no, probably. Now being in China, for us, it's um, a really a good, good, a good story because we can, we, we have access to most of the materials. So we are not really affect, we are not affected by any shortage, which is fantastic. In Europe, we don't find almost the same materials now. So it's really a crazy story now. And brand awareness. If we are international, if we are global, if we can leverage our experience worldwide, it's clear that Igusini becomes a brand and you know, it's the fundamental of having uh, some consistent brand awareness worldwide. Or service improvement to top customers. Being there, being here, following up the entire chain, the entire process, uh, we never leave them alone. And this allows us to provide the best service class for our customers. Of course, there are also some exploitation of market strengths. Emerging, not only. For example, now, uh, from a lighting point of view, USA can be considered an emerging market, where, whereas it's a, um, a truly mature market. It depends. The sector where we compete in, some countries can be considered mature or not. So emerging market for us is also US. And we're exploiting a booming market because now they are um, swapping from traditional sources of lighting to LED. Still, imagine. More than 60% of lights are not LED in US, still. Uh, opportunities. Sometimes we go abroad, not because of economy scales, not because there are uh, several business plans, not because of this or that, just because there is an opportunity. We bought a company in August in uh, North America because there was an opportunity. Apart from gaining market share, uh, it's an emerging market, booming market, etc., etc. But there was an opportunity. Good price, good value for money, and for uh, our business uh, plan, it was perfect to buy. It was a good opportunity. These are main brands we work with. So automotive, we work with Audi, we do work with Lamborghini, Maserati, Ferrari, etc. And we are in the, in the fashion, uh, fashion. Uh, we have fashion customers as well. I mean, uh, uh, companies, uh, pret porter companies, Rolex, etc. So really important customers. Then the how. Uh, Francesca was saying before, it's not just export or setting up a company. There are several ways of going abroad. And of course, according to the ways we're going abroad, there is also a different investment. We start from zero equity and zero risk, almost zero risk, to an investment of equity and so a higher level of risk. Of course, this is not, it's pretty 
rare that you go straight with the last one, but it's, it can be because some countries force you to do that. For example, if you are in Qatar, if you are in Saudi, if you are in Middle East, either you do that, either you don't go. Uh, there are other forms too, other ways of uh, getting to the market, but they are a little bit riskier than these ones. So you invest immediately. Other markets, you can start, you know, moving step uh, one after the other. So you export, you have an area manager, you set up a representative office, then you have a branch, a subsidiary, blah, 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 blah. So it depends on how fast the market goes, what, is our, what are our goals in the market, and the opportunities coming from the market, and, and of course, also the local legislations. Because the first rule, golden rule for me, is that, especially in internationalization processes, one size doesn't fit all at all. Then here, for example, the experience of Iguzzini. If we put control on the left and the risk on the bottom, you see that uh, distribute, we, we, there are several ways of uh, going uh, abroad. Iguzzini, as you can see, chose, chosen in its experience several of them. There is no one way. One size doesn't fit all. And in our experience of several years of going abroad, of internationalizing the company, this is what happened. So, I finished up my presentation. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Otherwise, I will leave uh, the, the stage to Francesca. Can you hear me? No, I, I know, Francesca, you have uh, more consideration, maybe, no, for no, conclusion, no, no. or ideas uh, I, I want to give the opportunity uh, to, make, to the students to ask questions. Dialogues, but yes, first we can ask if the students, or not students, uh, or people in the room, uh, would like to have some questions for, for our Maybe we can start to break the, the ice. Michele, go, no, with, I was a, a go with our common interest. Of course, no, I, I think, uh, I know, Francesca, you... There is a question there. Okay, Francesca. I don't know if it's appropriate, but you can... Okay. No, my, my question is, you have many collaborations with the uh, architects. Um, so while uh, you are creating a system, you, you talk about uh, creating a system of lighting uh, and also the fact of having uh, some specification in some parts uh, of the words and so on. So how is the, who is the author of the lighting system? You or the architect? So how it works in terms of uh, uh, ownership uh, of the rights uh, of the, of the system, uh, uh, the lighting system. Thank you for the question. Uh, it's appropriate. Um, we work with uh, several designers, architects and lighting designers. Uh, Villemot is a French architect, pretty famous, and uh, he designed several products of Iguzzini. Then he also have uh, several projects for Wild, and he can it can include the products developed with Iguzzini or also other products. But often, almost often, although he has several lighting designers within his studio, he relies on the services of Iguzzini. So or even if the architect designed the products, often the architect, the studio, relies on Iguzzini internal lighting designers to develop the lighting project. Because from one side, we have the industrial design and the design of the product. Then we have also the lighting design project. So how we would uh, install uh, these pro products uh, within the space. So there are two main souls. The architects that design the buildings, desi can design also the products if he's an industrial designer. And also then there is the lighting designer. So there is always a um, shared uh, knowledge and uh, activities between the company and the designers. Another example, Dan Skira, Croatian lighting designer, 
but he also designed the product. So although he's, he's a lighting designer, he can also do something about the industrial design. So he designed the products, and then he designed also the lighting project because he's a lighting designer. But still, he relies thoroughly on the lighting designer department of Iguzzini. So I don't know if I answered your question. It can be the product design, the lighting project design, the architecture, uh, the building design, but all of them then convey uh, the request to Iguzzini to support uh, with our internal knowledge of our products, the, the project. Any other question from uh, the room? a way of uh, facing the market, has the pandemic affected it? I mean, did you change your way of managing the company or not? What happened in your company? Okay, we know what happened in, every, in my life, in your life, okay, but in general, have you changed your way of facing the market or not? Or how much time do you have? Because <laughs> actually, yes, indeed, it would be impossible to answer no. It means that we wouldn't uh, in, include in our daily business uh, the interaction with the external environment, which means managerial myopia and, again, uh, some problems in the long run. So, of course, yes. How? Um, well, several aspects. For example, we open up uh, an e-commerce channel uh, for China. But to develop, develop this channel, of course, we need also products that are not really systems, but are products, and I don't want, don't want to say decorative products, but something that is still technical, but can be also fitted in a house, in a, very, in a residential application area, which is not really the field of Iguzzini. So we are turning the Titanic towards a more technical deco world. This impacts also on the channels of sales, still B2B business to business, so that's our natural DNA, but in a dif with different means. E-commerce in China will be in the US next year. Different products, different interpretation of our products, uh, more colors, more rounded shapes. Uh, so product-wise, uh, channel-wise, this could be considered or means to get the channel, to be able to say, these can be some, uh, some changes that uh, come up into my mind now. But then uh, also uh, the position of the person in the center of the company with uh, really much pow more power than before. For example, now we are, uh, there is this strong contamination between uh, offices and houses, uh, hospital and houses. So uh, when we are at the office now, we want to feel as comfy as we are at home, more or less. And when we are at our place, we want sometimes a technical light because we need to work from our places. This contamination wasn't brought onto the stage by the COVID. No, COVID just boosted something that it was already on the scene. If we don't uh, see that, then uh, in, in, uh, imagine that uh, the company before COVID, 25% of turnover, 50 million was retail. Actually, we're not doing 50 million retail anymore because several retailers closed, some of them reduced the spaces, offices likewise. And what we're doing in HQ, because the change in mind, we say in English they say change the people, or change the people. I prefer change the people, but change people's mind. So, but the change means, needs to be also physical, visible. So, for example, the third floor over there was the, the floor of the power, family, CEO over there, no, in the crystal tower. I asked uh, a pretty famous architect from Venice, come, this is my idea of office from now on. And so we are really uh, destroying the third floor, and the third floor will become a shared, inclusive, transpar transparent communication areas. And we will call each area of this 400 meter square space with one, each, each of the five areas uh, will have the name of our values, integrity, openness, beauty, etc., etc. So it will be really to communicate how important culture and values are now even more than before, and to drive the change from inside. Not anymore the power, not anymore the time, not anymore I'm looking with nose up. No, not anymore. That's not the, the word anymore. Contamination. Contamination of roles, soft skills, and uh, also places where we live. Okay. 
I don't know if I gave it. Then no, I can I go on young, for another three hours. But <laughs> sustainability. It's a huge impact on sustainability. Now I don't accept anymore a system or product that is not uh, recyclable or that doesn't hold uh, at least 50% of recycled materials inside. Connectivity, huge investment in the digitalization of the company, which doesn't mean to change the ERP. It's a completely yeah. another world to, to get to the customer in a digital way, completely different approach. So now we are running 7,000 webinars on products, on culture. So we're doing several things. And we're going back to culture and design. These are other two things. So now I'm sending out the iconic and heritage program. So we will, every year, we will come up with some products belonging to our ancient times. Designed by Gioponti, designed by Renzo Piano, designed by these Massoni. There are some products amazing. So we have this heritage, let's exploit it to let's all together feel more comfortable at our places. So would you say there's more than an opportunity? It's always an opportunity. opportunity. It's always an opportunity. Because okay. change, okay, we fear change. I fear, I'm young, but I fear change as well. But I always embrace change because it's an opportunity to live a Live against the change, it's just, you know, uh, effort waste. And so it's just, uh, I always embrace change. And, and um, COVID uh, it was not, is not nice, but at the end of the day, it was a way to, you know, as an, it was an opportunity. It is an opportunity. Yes, thank you. Maybe a question on my side for both, or even starting from Francesca as an expert, uh, an observer of their, uh, their story. This is about China, so without knowing details or strategies, uh, I realized that in a very few years uh, you, you got a lot of uh, success in China because of uh, the, you know, the works uh, you did, uh, you, the architects you were collaborating with. Uh, so knowing something more about what happened in China, because China is a very hard market for international companies. So I know you also used to do a a class on this, on the story, the success story of a very good scene in, uh, in China. So there are also many Chinese students in the room, so may, they might be interested about it. Personally, from an academic perspective, I think that the experiences in China uh, is quite successful. Uh, their experience in China started uh, in 25, 21. 2005, so quite uh, early, and they were able to um, start from there a, a, a production plant that was able to boost the presence in China. So China was chosen because of the low cost of labor, but not only because it was chosen because it was a very important outlet market, a promising outlet market where big projects could be developed. So from my perspective, their presence in China at the moment was a very successful story. And as far as I see from my perspective, uh, being in China at that moment meant for them to be there while China was booming and was transforming its economic system, uh, starting from the Olympics 2008 and all the other booming uh, events that were following that uh, important year. Now the situation is changing. Uh, the, the perspective of China is changing a lot and it is very easy to uh, see this. If you read the plans, the five-year plan, the new 14 five-year plan, China has shifted from an export-oriented country, very open to international contamination, to a country that is more reliant on its strength, so consumer-based. Uh, economy and this means I think a complex market a very challenging place but they are already there so they are in a position where they can choose stay there because it's convenient or go away if it's not convenient as in the past so uh, beside the numbers and beside the projects that are astonishing from my point of view what they did when I go to Beijing I see good scene light everywhere <laughs> starting from the square, uh, uh, Tiananmen Square uh, oh, wow. So I think that now they have the strength to choose what to do in China uh, because they were there in the right moment. Uh, so I give the floor to Cristiano so he can tell a little bit more about the history in China. Well, China, thank you. Uh, <laughs> 
Oh, oh, yes, yes, you were polite. <laughs> we have a slightly different opinion. Um, chi perspective. Ch uh, China, for a good scene in 2006, when the, the, the journey uh, was born, actually was mainly a uh, yes, uh, sales uh, outcome country, and uh, it was also uh, an ideal logistic center, productive hub. Um, then uh, what happened? Uh, actually, now we are the first foreigner producer in China. So, not bad. But this, being a this, uh, foreign producer, first foreign producer means 8 million euros. 8 million euros out of a production locally of 35 million euros, which means that 5 millions goes, uh, to the, uh, 3 millions goes to the market and 35 millions come back to uh, Recanati the other five millions are shared around other subsidiaries. So, um, are bought by other subsidiaries. So I produce their 35 millions and uh, I use for the local market three millions out of that. So from a sustainability point of view, from a logistic point of view, it doesn't make good sense anymore. So I send over their materials because I want to produce the same quality as the product would exit from an Italian factory and then I get back the finished product. We cannot take a decision based on our stomach and uh, on uh, the daily news. Of course, uh, we were saying before that now a pallet logistically cost from $1,500, same volume, same dimension, same weight, to now it costs up to 70000 The fiscal uh, regulation changed considerably for, for expats in, uh, in, uh, chi is changing in China. And then the labor cost raised up incredibly along the last 10 years. So the question is, does China, is China still attractive? For me, yes, but it depends. The answer is it depends. It depends on what? On the sector you are competing with. In, for example, our, as you saw from the video, our production is mainly based on labor, on capital, sorry which means that the same machine here and there cost more or less the same. So I cannot exploit the benefit of being in China logistically because I bring back everything. Now bringing back everything costs much more. The labor cost, which is a minor thing for me, is small, and especially after 15 years, I'm not developing the country in a manner that I dreamt of, because 8 million, considerable achievement, but not enough to make a factory sustainable. So if you could see that we go back from, uh, we'll go away from China, I cannot tell you because I don't know, but actually these macro um, macroeconomic strengths are pretty visible and, uh, and easy to see. Uh, then again, uh, we cannot take decision. Uh, the belly feeling decision is, is gives you the, 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 the taste of something, but give, doesn't give you the final uh, decision. So the belly feeling could be that one, but then we cannot decide based on actual figures, actual numbers, because we need to normalize the logistics, we need to normalize everything that is happening in a really crazy way in the recent years. So. It was important, yes. Was it important, yes. It is still important, yes. It will be as important as today, tomorrow, I don't know. Thank you very much. And I think we have a time for one more question. So if anybody wants to take the opportunity, I, I can, please. Enjoy. Okay. Can I take All it? Right. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your comprehensive explanation. Uh, you mentioned the sustainability, and I, I'm not sure the concept of sustainability that you mentioned and I realized is the same or not, but and nowadays you see the sustainability as everywhere in design, procurement, I don't know, construction phase, uh, and there is a public concern uh, due to the, I don't know, climate change and environmental uh, problems. I want to know what's the role of su sustainability from the point of view that I said in your company. Uh, because you have to adopt your uh, designs and your um, product with the country that you work. For example, I know uh, there is no 
the same regulation of sustainability in China and in England. How, did you man how do you manage that? How, is there any specific regulation for your company uh, in, sustain in sustainability or you uh, adapt your uh, product with the target market? Thank you for the question. Uh, no. sustainability, we leave sustainability as a process, not mm -hmm. as a um, standalone uh, uh, fact. So, as a process, uh, it involves uh, all the departments of the company. One step back. Imagine a product sold in Italy, sold in the US. It's not the same product because there are different regulations and uh, different electricity um, requirements. So, electrical requirements. So the voltage, etc., is different. The same in Hong Kong, the same in UK. So, um, before sustainability, we had to tune our products to the local market's requirements and regulations. Another example, the glare. In Italy, we are very strict at uh, public glare. Not in Nordic uh, countries, uh, uh, not in US. So, our products have hold some features for Italy that doesn't have for other markets. This is typical when you are a globalized or international company. Then sustainability. <clears throat> of course, there are several certifications, and every certification is different. But actually, as a, as a choice, we don't want to follow up the certifications required by the markets. Because otherwise, it's just a trend. It's just you know, something that you, you do, not because you believe in, but you do because it, you want to sell your product. Instead, we leave it as a process. So we changed all the, 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 the fleet, the, the, the car, car's fleet. So now all cars are hybrid or electrical within Eagles in the world, or no more plastic in any factories or subsidiaries of Eagles or uh, we, we want to achieve, we achieved last year um, the energetic consumption pari, uh, equal to zero. Uh, this year, sorry, we will achieve this year uh, zero consumption of electricity. Why? Solar panel, huge investment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we we have, we have changed several uh, plants and machineries in uh, the factories because now we run only with electrical ones, now with the carbon or gas ones. So we have invested heavily on a process: factory, people. Um, no, we don't print uh, any catalogs uh, out anymore. Uh, so it's really, it's really affecting all the departments, marketing, finance, uh, factories, et cetera, et cetera, within the company worldwide. Then, of course, there are regulations to sell the product, which is uh, the, a little bit the less romance part. So we are taking the certifications necessary to sell that product in UK or in uh, another country. But without the incredible job we have started now, at least three, four years, that we are undertaking this kind of huge job about sustainability and uh, letting the company being more sustainable than before, we couldn't achieve the incredible results in getting those certifications. One example, we got uh, last year the Ecovadis certification. So there is a sample of uh, 75,000 European companies enrolled in the program. We got the silver um, medal, which means that we are among the 13% better company in terms of sustainability in all Europe across these 75,000 samples. So, but you can't really invent sustainability just because you put in the website we are sustainable. It's not enough. We need to leave it a process and we need to believe in, in it as a process, but as a way also of living. So I go back to the culture of the company. Because in, seven, in the 70s, this company started speaking about the sustainable lights. And when my, my product, instead of a competitor product, uh, consumes uh, the consumption, energy consumption is less than 60% on some families of products, 60% less uh, smaller cons energy consumption. It's already another way of uh, uh, you know, achieving sustainability. Or, for example, when I don't substitute my products because they, last, they are really long-lasting. It's another way of when I make my products completely recyclable. There are several ways in the market, within the company, with the people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
I leave the floor to Francesca to sum up, so. to summarize this uh, meaningful discussion. Please, Francesca, so I was and then ready we conclude. To, I was ready to cut, so I just cut a little bit, uh, just uh, still three more minutes of your time today, just to have some takeaways from this uh, meeting today. Uh, of course, you met a CEO, you have listened to the history of this company, you have listened to the experience of Cristiano. But what we have learned about globalization, I think uh, the title of, of this meeting today was Going Global to Preserve Local Economic and Social Growth. So you saw Recanati everywhere. Italy is at the center of the strategy of Iguzzini, despite being a global company and very go complex company. So for just four key points I would like to underline. The first one, uh, sometimes internationalization also in the political debate is not considered so catchy. At the moment it's considered sometimes a hot topic and it's more important to reshore activities to bring back uh, to uh, the nation some investment made abroad. But we have listened today, we have heard today that uh, internationalization is necessary to support the firm's growth. So you become international to preserve local competitive advantages. And you cannot survive without internationalization in some sectors, indeed. And it's like playing chess. I mean, internationalization doesn't mean necessarily only FDI, foreign direct investment, and delocalization. We have seen many uh, ways that Guzzini is following to be international, also collaboration with worldwide architect, as was pointed out by, uh, by the speaker, by the, the question before. So it's picking up the best in international markets to consolidate firms' competitive advantages. So you pick up the best, you open a production plant in China and in the US, not in another place, why? Because there are some specific advantages there. And why do you do that? to become stronger in your uh, company. So to, to preserve the local uh, growth and local social and economic value. One size doesn't fit all. Every sector, every situation, every industry has a specificity. So it's not possible to talk in general about internationalization. We have seen the model of Iguzzini that might be completely different for Ferrero, for example, or for Fiat or for other companies. Indeed, every situation needs to be considered uh, with specific attention to the specificity of the sector. The last part, stay hungry, stay foolish, a global company is confronted with the broad challenges of competition. And we have seen today the challenges of Industry 4.0, of sustainability, of facing a pandemic. Uh, these require vision, huge managerial skills, and we have seen an example today, and ability uh, to learn how to learn uh, how to swim in dangerous waters. So you always find challenges to face, but you grow from uh, challenges and from external shocks that push you to the limit sometimes. So internationalization is a way, I would say, to not only survive, but to grow internationally, but to become stronger in your local area, in your local um, roots. So this is what I would like to underline. Uh, it was very short, sorry, it was very compact, but the time is over now. So if you want, we can talk in another time more deeply into this uh, topic that is my uh, commonly teaching research topic. So I thank you for um, sharing the opportunity with us to be yeah. with you and to talk about this topic of internationalization with the presence of a uh, young and successful uh, top manager. Thank you very much from our Thank side, you. to both Cristiano Venturini and Francesca Spicarelli. As you know, it was the second uh, lecture Top of this series for, dedicated to international stories within Top Experience, but was the first uh, in person. So thank you very much for coming uh, to have the discussion face and to face. And China was yes, within was us. was a kind anyway. of a facilitator. <laughs> yeah. And uh, also the formula, I look to Francesca, we are organizing this series, so having to dialoguing on the topic, yeah. it was very successful. So I think we, we are going also to repeat. Uh, we, we, we could go on for Having a, a professor <laughs> and a manager together dialoguing with the students. Great, okay. uh, great event. Thank you Thank very much. You. Thank you.